Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana. And, uh, well, we're kind of post-election, and, and as you know, the last couple of shows were about the mechanics of our vote and uh, how to make our votes count. And uh, with that in mind, I want to remind people that anyone who might be interested in participating in the Connecticut Citizens Election Audit, uh, in which you get to observe the uh, recounting, hand counting of ballots to make sure that our voting machines in Connecticut are working properly. Um, there's still time to get involved. And uh, if you go to the CT Voters Count website, there will be a link to the uh, Connecticut Citizens Audit and people can sign up to uh, observe those audits. First time uh, observers never go alone. You always go with a partner and, and it is really interesting. Uh, so now um, between election day and the end of the year, uh, traditionally Thinking Green talks um, to people who are involved with organizations, nonprofits that are doing good work in our region or nation or internationally uh, because we get so uh, confronted with uh, the consumerism of the season. I, I think it isn't even Thanksgiving and we're seeing like Christmas lights being advertised. It gets pretty nuts, uh, the whole mania to buy stuff. And, and most of us have plenty of stuff. So at this time of year, I really like to focus on organizations that are doing important work uh, and donating to them really can make a difference. And this year in particular, there are a lot of people uh, feeling very stressed. There are a lot of things that we hold kind of near and dear in our society that are feeling very threatened uh, and vulnerable right now. And over the next uh, six or seven weeks, we're going to try to uh, talk about some of those. And, you know, as a list, you know, the environmental issues, uh, women's reproductive rights, First Amendment rights, immigrants' rights, LGBT rights um, are all on the list. But um, though it seems a little less desperate, equally on the list is education and public education in, in particular. So tonight I have with me Myrna Martinez. Welcome. Thank you, Rana. And uh, Myrna and I um, are both on the board of an organization called Republic Ed. And we're going to talk about that, um, especially in light of uh, as we're seeing some of the potential cabinet picks under the new administration. And public education was really kind of under assault under the current administration. And it looks like things could get even worse. So we're going to talk about that. So just to introduce, I, didn't, I guess I should have given you this slide, but I don't know if people can see it. So Republic Ed, it's about, so re-separating, re-about public education, because that's what it's about. It's about the, um, the development and preservation of public education. But also, there's no space here, because Republic, um, a Republic is the government in which we there are in unalienable rights and public education being one of those. So just to give you a visual yeah. of the name. And so maybe you can start a little and talk about um, what kind of concerns about education led to the uh, forming of Republic Ed. Uh, um, seeing that at a local level that if at you know anywhere at your local level that if we are going to um, take care of our public education system that we really can't do it by just like looking down at our toes and being unaware of bigger trends in education that are beyond us so knowing what's happening in Chicago and New Orleans and California and Philadelphia anywhere is beneficial to us because you know that's how we we tend to work as societies. There's these these trends that happen, and um, I'd say you know that's a part of the formation. And, and although New London doesn't have a big population, a lot of what's going on in much bigger cities 
really has relevance here as well. Definitely, you know, the, the fact that we are um, a, a low income um, education system, we have 85% free and reduced lunch, or at least those were the numbers prior to magnetization, so to the 25% out of district that we're seeking, um, that we are uh, a district where our tax base is is minimal that a lot of and 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 our students needs are great um, a lot of similar issues arise that in, in other than in larger cities so definitely that's an important piece of looking at what's happening elsewhere and, and may be coming this way or at least aware of of what the counters are to those pieces and you know i served on the board of ed one term and you're currently serving and one of the challenges i had is uh you know, you vote on things and you have to vote yes or no. So you're already vote, having to almost oversimplify an issue to figure out which way to vote. But it was really challenging to really get the broad information that you need to, to uh, make the best decision because, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You, you, you can't really make an informed decision if you don't have access to the information. And it isn't always easy to find it. Yeah. So, to, do you, I mean, are you expanding? Are you talking about like, th those trends that? Well, that and uh, and other issues too. Uh, you know, one of the issues, and we'll talk about it in more detail uh, later. But you know, one of the first things concerns I had when I got on the board was some of the discipline policy, mm -hmm. and um, it is. And I was really looking purely locally. You know, we had a policy at that time that I thought was overly punitive, counterproductive, and unfair uh, regarding uh, very young kids' penalties if they didn't wear their uniform to school. And, uh, and it was really, the information was not very forthcoming. Like, at the time, I had mm -hmm. no clue that there are other districts out there that were kind of grappling with the same thing. A lot of city school districts do have, uni have kids wearing school uniforms. And at the time, it didn't even occur to me to try to look beyond our city and beyond our state to see how other districts might be implementing their uniform policies. Uh, enforcement either no, no better than we were, or finding ways that are better. So, you know, I was really interested in this, you know, forming this group, being involved in it, because it's really important for us to, to broaden our own horizons uh, and, you know, learn from whoever's doing things well and, and, and find solidarity where people and districts are struggling as we are. Sure, sure, that networking piece. And also, I don't know if you were leading towards the idea that one of our current endeavors is forming an online resource library and just opened it up right now. And um, the resources by topic, for instance, are how kids learn, what works to evaluate teacher, students, teachers, and schools, challenges to learning, misguided efforts that haven't worked, and the benefits of a high quality public education for all. So having that as a resource, whether it be a board of education member, a parent, or whatever community organizer is a helpful tool to have that all together. And the point of it is that it's accessible to everyone and it's kind of a, a library in progress. Yeah, oh yeah, it's <laughs> very preliminary right now. It's just a, a skeleton. So. Um, looking back to the big picture uh, of ed public education in the United States right now, um, one of the biggest concerns, I guess, is the uh, taking of the public education out of the public sector, Yeah. the privatization. Yes, yes. So I don't know. We have a little film. Yeah, I don't I know if we want to start. start with that. I think it is a good place to okay. start, yeah, and bring up some questions. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.
believe because they have the Milano money, they got smart. And very often they come in and try to dominate a school district. Why would I want to add charter schools into my portfolio? Well, I think it's a very stable business. The industry's growing about 12 to 14 percent a year. If you look at their boards of directors, tend to be full of hedge fund managers and investment bankers. Uh, the education market is seen as a tremendous market. This is a school district committed to education reform. No more reform! No more reform! The strategies I thought would work don't work. Merit pay doesn't work. Uh, carrots and sticks don't work. Labeling teachers is ineffective or effective based on test scores has been proven again and again not to work. I was wrong, and I'm embarrassed to have been any part of this movement. This is a manifestation of what I care about is the quality of public services in my gated community, and not a dime of my money is going to go to take care of people where I don't benefit. They're spending their tax dollars. Maybe a parent values a religious education more than they value a higher academic education at their neighborhood school. That's their choice. The political spectrum is driving the schools. The educational spectrum is not. Well, I'm here to remind you and thank you um, for allowing politics to be part of what you do in this district. That's a real problem. Probably the number one problem in the country today. Bunch of corporations get together and get tax write-offs for bankrolling a, a charity called the American Legislative Exchange Council. I was never a conspiracy theorist about public education until, until I started doing my work on Alec. Now there's suddenly one big happy family, the corporations, the lobbyists, the politicians. I value the work of lobbyists. Without lobbyists, where would we get our information? I'm in the Wizard of Oz and somebody pulled that curtain away and I'm going, really? You know, if you look at it only as the right wing is doing this, that's interesting. But more importantly, the right wing and the Obama administration are working hand in glove and that is bizarre. Look at these people, they've, they've all turned out to support their schools. They're walking out of schools, and, and that draws national attention. This issue was so important that it needed to be brought to the streets. There is still a huge fight to be waged just to save public education. These corporations have the money. These CEOs have the money. These banks have the money, and it's not fair. Okay, so um, we hear a lot about, um, of hype, about uh, privatizing schools being the answer to low achieving schools. So, so where to start? Uh, I, I think that video was a good place to start. Like one of the things that really stands out for me is the stock market. The fact that we have those schools in stock market, you have to think about what are the what are the priorities in place there to make money. Obviously, not to service our kids. So you want to cut in so many in so many places. You want to have a certain type of student that isn't going to be as costly. Um, uh, it's it's a really it's a what is there's a a quote from Rupert Murdoch, um, a business mogul, and it's, he says, when, he, or he said, um, uh, when it comes to K through 12 education, we see a $500 billion sector in the US. You know, so it's an opportunity for those who want to make money, but for those of us who care about where our society goes, it's a really uh, a frightening prospect to have our public education dismantled. And, you know, I was, Talking to a mutual friend of ours, uh, Helen Sandals, uh, a couple months ago about uh, our healthcare system and how um, I had ne not known this, but but up until about 30 years ago, it was not legal for a doctor to work for anyone except another doctor because the Hippocratic oath was supposed to trump everything else. The doctor was responsible to the patients for the patients uh, and was required to do things for the patient's well-being, not to recommend a more expensive procedure because they'd make more money on it. Their, their obligation was clear. And then through HMOs and the, the, tr the, the changing of our healthcare system in general, um, 
doctors are now employed by hospitals, they might be employed by HMOs, and if the goal of some of these employers is to make money or to balance their budget, if they're a non, even if they're a nonprofit, then the doctors, they suddenly have a conflict of interest. And it seems like that kind of thing can filter through in this privatized school system too, that the teachers might feel, yes, their obligation is to the children, but their bosses might be saying, no, you have an obligation to make sure this company is successful financially. So, sure. I think that also that's what, what it, where I see the comparison is that conflict of interest in um, in what your priorities are actually kind of takes us into the testing situation. You know, when you're when um, you have the high stakes testing that that has the threat upon a district or because of low test scores, which sometimes. Um, aren't just don't just have to do with with how the district is performing but with situations that students come from if you have english language learners they're obviously not going to be starting off in the same place if you've got um extreme poverty and, and trauma um there's there are things that that hold you that you need to deal with um institutionally in order to um, overcome these obstacles and so but when you have this push to um, have certain test scores at an extreme level, the high stakes testing. Um, you have you have you know teachers and administrators who are have this push and pull of what they know developmentally they should be doing with their students, and yet what they need to systematically, um, if they need to see a number move, which isn't necessarily a long term goal. You know, um, but I but I wanted to go back for a second to um, the privatization, the the charter, because. Um, you know, we're, we're using we're using charter as a, a broad term, but I do want to acknowledge that charters were started for the intention, and we have you know many great charters out there that were started for the intention of innovation, for having an opportunity to do something outside of the system and take a group of teachers, perhaps who had these great ideas and wanted to do things a little bit differently. The problem is where it's gone, and the um, opportunity that investors have taken to turn it into a money maker and having the corporate um, corporate charters the there are storefront charters you know that um, have barely have students actually going in or that are, are really or or the great um, and you know it's it's not it's not everyone but the but the on um, a lot of online online work that we're they're getting where the institutions are getting the same whether it's twelve thousand or fifteen thousand per pupil and they're just seeing kids online every now and then and sometimes never even showing up well i guess part of the issue is like there the rules for accountability are just not there yeah it's a different system i mean when when we speak of a charter it's um they're publicly funded but they're privately managed so you're right. So they don't have the um, the publicly elected officials who are accountable due to the population who will who will who has the right to all of our public information and also has the ability to say um, it's time for someone else you know to come in. And and, and although um, you know we often hear complaints about the bureaucracy in public education, and I'm sure they're sure. not. They're founded to some extent. The opposite extreme of having zero accountability could actually be much more disastrous. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the concerns is, you know, with, with a charterization of a system that there are abilities for pockets of excellence. I, don't, I think it was this past video, I couldn't hear it, um, that might have mentioned the pockets of excellence, but the concern about the deterioration all around it because a charter school only has responsibility for its whatever the population would be it could be 500 students whatever that that school is right. responsible for but district wide or in, you know on the bigger systematic sense it doesn't have that responsibility and in fact in some ways the public school system that's local is responsible for some of the the pieces that the charter schools don't pick up like special education sure sure transportation yeah um my niece is um 
education advocacy lawyer in uh, New Orleans, and she works with a lot of students who should be getting special education services, and so it, it's awful. <laughs> it's just a terrible situation to try to make sure these students get the services they need in a, a system that has been largely privatized. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can speak to that more, and I find that really intriguing. So I mean, just so that everybody yeah. knows, this New Orleans, um, after Katrina, the, the entire New Orleans it's, public school system is down to about five or six public yeah, schools? Yeah, very few public schools. I don't know yeah. exactly how many, but the rest are it, it, it's largely charter school. Yeah. And it's gotten high grades in some ways uh, in terms of the event for the people who like charter schools. Uh, they, um, they say, oh, you know, I don't know. It gets, it, it's gotten high grades. But I know when Jonathan Pelto was on the show, I think it was a couple years ago, he showed like actual achievement uh, comparisons between Connecticut um, and, and Louisiana. And on this one national scale, Louisiana had gotten a B plus and Connecticut got a C minus, but all down the line in terms of student achievement, even in those basic subjects that the high stakes tests focus on, uh, Louisiana got higher grades because, I don't know, students had more choices and you didn't have teachers' unions. and They, they were measuring for, for something that was totally mm. unrelated to what the students were learning or what their students' total experience was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the numbers that I've actually seen are that the, um, the scores are the same for the system as a whole, because yeah. it's not a system. So these pieces right. that as a whole, that the numbers are the same that it, than, it, than they were pre-Katrina. But, but I am curious about how is it that the, there is difficulty now in servicing special education students? Well, next time she's in Connecticut, I'll have to ask Maybe her. we can FaceTime her in next time? That'd be yeah, great. really. Okay. Uh, I know, I, I just asked her briefly last time I saw her, which was several months ago. and. She said it, 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 it is very challenging. She's, it, it's like you know, a lot of these students and their families really do need mm -hmm. to contract with the services mm -hmm. of attorneys mm -hmm. to get what oh, wow. federal law is uh, required mm -hmm. them, them to get. But mm -hmm. it isn't coming easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to po point out one other um, issue that we hear criticisms that the U.S. schools are falling behind worldwide. And I, I guess, you know, I kind of would like to lay that to bed that, you know, we, we do have, and we'll talk more about this also, in Connecticut and in the country, we have huge income disparities. We have a very high percent of, of kids in poverty um, in every state, really. And when you adjust for poverty, uh, the U.S. schools are doing really quite well. And I don't know. Yeah, do can I we look at, at the, that map? Yeah, here. We have a slide. So, yeah, if you look at this map, um, percent of low-income students in the U.S. public, I can't see public oh, education, public schools. schools. I have poor eyesight. Um, you'll see that if, if you think generally that the uh, southern states perhaps have a not, not as good of a reputation um, in, in pu for public education, but simultaneously that those are the states that have a high percentage of low-income students. Meaning more, than, that they, more than half. Yeah, meaning that they, they come to the system with a lot of issues. And if you're not, um, if, if, if you're, your brain is not ready, if you're not psychologically there ready to learn because you have other other problems, other bigger concerns in your life, then that's that's an issue. And so, looking at Connecticut, for instance, um, we we compare to other nations really well. We're we're up there. Um, and if you look at overall, we are in the highest of the bracket for um, students, low income students. At the same time, that's an that's an overall number, that's an average. But in Connecticut, we also have one of the highest disparities of income, and so therefore also highest disparities in achievement. Um, we have our, our, 
our districts with the lowest um, funding for schools so, and, and going along with the low income students the because our um, education money greatly comes from our local property taxes um, we have districts whose per pupil expenditure is about 12,000 and then you'll have Greenwich which is about 24,000 per pupil and then there's one other community that's about 25,000 per pupil so obviously what they can provide for their students is is much more than what a 12,000 per pupil can provide. And that being said, that the 12,000 per pupil communities tend to be communities where the needs are so much greater. You're gonna have special ed costs that are so much greater. You're gonna have English language learners. You're, you're going, the, the needs are just that much greater. And um, home lives also um, don't tend to be as, as they don't have the, often the ability to have extracurricular and enriching um, opportunities. Well, you know, looking at this map, I'm really sorry we didn't search around and find a similarly coded map of Connecticut town by town, mm, yeah. because it would show the same range that, you know, some places would be that dark green color and yeah. New London and Willimantic and Hartford and New Haven and Waterbury maybe might be that bright red. Yeah, yeah. And this is by no means to say that those districts with high with low income students cannot achieve. That's not the intent at all. It's to say that we have to be intentional beyond simply the standard um, uh, core subject matters and think about what are all what is what is everything that you need to pay attention for our students in order for them to be in a place to be able to succeed now let's um, shift a little bit and uh, talk about testing we hear a lot about um, high stakes testing and how is this connected with the whole charter school privatization um, and answer briefly, and then we have a phone call. Um, you go for it. My mind's in a different direction. Oh, okay. I think you can, you can well, answer you, that. Okay. Um, just very briefly, what happens with the standardized tests is that, for one thing, the scores tend to correlate very closely with family income. You can look at the graphs side by side, and they're very close. Um, and they're only in a couple of subjects, uh, language arts, math, I think maybe social studies in some grades. Right, well right now it's just been language arts and math. And yeah. so you're really getting a very small snapshot of students. The tests are, are now taken on computers, so students who have computers at home are also more likely to do well. And these tests, the results are used not to plan better for in individual students, not even to plan better for classes of students, but to kind of rank schools, rank students, rank uh, school systems in a way that uh, leads some of them to be uh, punished for things that are beyond teacher control. Yeah, um, that leads perfectly into the, the, the next image, but you don't I'll, you I'll take, take the, the call, the call. First. yeah. Hi, thanks for calling. Hello, ladies. This is Dennis from New London. How are you doing? Hi, Dennis. How are you? Um, I have a few questions. Sure. Uh, I, was, I was looking at a thing on Facebook some time back, and they were talking about the 10 worst cities in Connecticut. And I think New London was like number three on the bottom end. But the one thing they said New London had going for it was that the students get the most money per student out of all the other towns and cities in uh, Connecticut. Is that true? That is not true at all. <laughs> we're, no, we're nowhere okay. near that, Dennis. That's why we, that's basically why we've gone into an all magnet school district because we don't have the, we don't have the funds necessary. And so therefore that was just nothing but one big incentive for us to say, yes, if we take in 25% and we convert into this district, we will get additional funding that's been committed to us from, from the state. That's, that's not true. It's, okay, it's now, interesting, though. Um, I just, uh, you can ask your, I, I just went to an economic uh, development related uh, meeting last week, and New London actually is like rated the number worst, no, number one worst city for 
like economic uh, state in, in uh, yeah, the is, state of that's Connecticut. What I was to but it's weird to me because I look in New London, it looks pretty vibrant. So I, I don't know exactly what the metrics are, but they, they make it look bad. But De I don't know. Dennis, what you might see is, um, is sometimes, well, you might see like New London. I think I saw something comparable in New London and maybe if it was East Line, please don't quote me because I'm not sure. But what you have to look at in those situations are what the needs are in New London. We're, we're mandated to provide special ed services, to provide English language learner services. Um, um, and so our, our needs are that much greater in, in New London. So you can't always look at it just number by not next to number. And, okay, and so now, okay. wait a minute. Oh, the magnet school situation now, um, I see all the time more and more towns close to us and outside of us that are getting their own magnet schools, whether it's one or two or three, whatever they're getting. And it makes me wonder if more and more towns are getting magnet schools, how are we going to get enough people, to enough, enough kids to come here to be able to meet our quota of out-of-town kids? I, I believe that right now, for instance, and it's the, um, the new Groton magnet schools, they're, they're intra-district. So it doesn't, they can't pull students from New London. They're just within their own community. I saw one from, I believe it was Norwich the other day in the paper, I think it was. And it mm -hmm. was a STEM magnet school like we have here, one of our first. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I, I get a little nervous with this whole concept. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were just talking about tests. Um, there's so much emphasis on, on the kids taking tests. Now, with the magnet school setup where you have maybe a kid that's going to go through uh, kindergarten in the fifth grade, uh, as a dancer or an artist or an engineer, you know, in, in the early stages and stuff like that. How, how do you, how do you give, give them tests like that that will relate to the rest of the country? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't quite understand the question. Okay, now the te the tests are for the, unless I'm wrong on this, is the, the, the rate, how the kids are doing in different districts. That's I mean, right. To bring them to a certain level yeah now but how do you do that with like a dancer or an artist or a musician those those are only extracurriculars or they're also um, ways of integrating other subjects into their core subjects so it doesn't take away at all it if anything it it enhances and that's part of the criticism of n not a criticism but that well, yeah it is a critique of districts when we cannot afford those extracurricular and other districts can, for example, music um, has been proven to to in, increase your academic abilities. The fact that you're, you know, I mean, I don't know exactly. Especially if, math. Yeah, especially math. But I've also heard language arts as well. That you know, as 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 a language, perhaps, and it's all, all in itself. If you're able to play, and if you've played an instrument, it has to be. Not one year won't make a difference, but two years at least does make a difference in your academic abilities. So it's, it's, it's created to enhance your, your academic abilities. It's not an inhibitor in any way. All right, one, one more question here. Yeah. So um, the magnet school setup, uh, bringing them up through kindergarten up to uh, junior high, into high school and stuff, and it's like you have your arts magnet schools, you have your science magnet schools, so forth and so on. Um, when you get into the arts, uh, how much of that is, is the, the basis for that magnet school? I mean, is it more um, on the educational side of the school or is it more on the arts side of the school? I lose the, the arts, the arts is education is what I was trying to say. Arts is a language, basically. Um, it's a way of communicating yourself. If you're able to express yourself in this other way and understand that and, and understand concepts through a certain, well, I mean, sometimes it's going to be abstract and sometimes it's not going to be ab abstract. Your, your, your ability to analyze is so much greater. I can't really, I can't really separate those. It's nothing but an, but an additive. I mean, I, I had, I had a student in, um, uh, starting in with uh, as a sixth grader who um, who wasn't very excited about um, your traditional academic um, 
um, endeavors. And and but he loved this artist um, named um, uh, Michiel. Oh, I forgot his name. But he <laughs> he really connected to this this artist. And every now and then, when he was academically and he was stuck. Um, what's his name? Artist. He, these little dreads created these like really graffiti-like pieces. Um, oh, I don't. Do you know? Remember. Anyway, remember the, every yeah. now and then, when he was stuck on something that was just purely academic, I would ask him to look at it from that artist's perspective. And he, in a sense, spoke this this artist wow. language, and he would automatically be able to kind of like pivot and say like, oh. Well, then that's like da 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 da. So it's 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 just another ability, like that, like like having multiple intelligences. Well, it's uh, interesting maybe. that um, I wanted to point out when I was first selected to Basquiat. Ed, Basquiat, that was the uh, artist. Oh yeah, of course. Um, Mark Patnode invited me to go to a one-day conference of artists who work with the Hot Schools program. Uh, it's a state program, higher order thinking schools. And they bring in artists of all different disciplines to work in schools around the state and add arts to the cu curriculum. And uh, a lot of our local artists are involved in it. Not only Mark, but Darren Wood is involved. Lana Burton is involved. Uh, Roger Trombley is involved. So one thing, I, I happened to sit in with a group that Darren was talking to. They were third grade teachers. The, the students were struggling with multiplication. And Darren was going to be working with them for half a year to use theater to help get multiplication concepts through to the students. Mm -hmm. And so through the arts, they, they were very intentionally using those to get students' understanding of academic concepts through you know, dance or theater or visual art. Yeah, I mean, um, just doing a, a quick, like, as, as Rana is speaking, trying to connect them quickly for you there, like um, math, if you know the Fibonacci series, it's a proportionality and understanding of proportionality and beauty, like why certain um, relic pieces of architecture, because of their proportion, are just beautiful to the human eye. So understanding that connection between um, our, our visual and and our mathematics or language arts, poetry. I mean, it's, it's for every single subject that we can connect and further understand in, in depth what we're, what we're learning. It's by no means a disconnect. All right, let me, let me okay. Nathan Hale School is what, what type of magnet, a magnet school? What's? That's the, the arts. What is it? Arts. Okay, so if you can, maybe this will help me. If you can uh, describe a normal day for a, a student at Nathan Hill? No, I, I can't. Okay. I can't I can't tell you a, a day there. I haven't I haven't I haven't worked there, but um, what school have you worked at? That's a magnet. School. I've actually I have worked at the Dual Language Arts Academy and so therefore I was giving you the example of this student and um, Basquiat and how we would be able to use an an artist um, in order to it in order to relate to your core subject matters. And speaking of Darren Wood, he came to the dual. Darren Wood, yeah. Yeah, Darren yeah. Wood. Well, he came yeah. to the Dual Language Arts Academy and did a um, a piece with history and theater. You know, and and how much more of getting what's happening historically when you step into their roles and and now have to act out society from a certain um, time. You know, you become those characters, and they wrote journals and 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 spoke as if they were as if they were those characters from the past uh, uh, oh. just small examples this sounds like uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you ladies go okay and, um, and we'll keep I'll talking talk later. all right uh, thank you for thank calling you. um i think this is a good transition into uh so how can we improve education i'd like to go to that slide which the um the joy of learning okay it's it's there Okay. So, so, joy of learning, and you see, you have your <laughs> your superintendent perhaps saying, "No biggie." But if he misses problem nine, we'll pull your accreditation, and you'll be shame on your community. <laughs> and then you have the principal, no pressure. But if he misses problem nine, you're you're out of a teaching job. Yeah. And then the teacher says, "David, it's problem nine. You know problem nine. Relax, relax." And you have the child there attempting to relax and 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 succeed at 
at this. And, and the, I think the reason they're calling it problem nine is because it's a narrowing of what education is, is about. It's a narrowing to be able to um, uh, look at it, look at the success through the score of these language arts and math, and not those two subjects, but but in this multiple choice. I mean, I just, you know, you're looking at the image, and therefore not me, but I'm I'm making my hand from wide to, like, you know, <laughs> so you're you're taking, you know, everything what learning is about, and then you're you're narrowing it down to these two subjects, which are really hugely important, but then you're narrowing it down to to what these people say you need to know in a multiple choice form, and it becomes this tedious, and this is why we call it high stakes testing. It's just about what your accreditation or your, your, the shame on your community and, and your teaching job, and, but no big deal, you know? And to do this on a yearly basis um, um, to students for hours on end, it's, and, and in many districts, um, um, by, because this is the focus, putting aside those other areas that, you know, the arts and other areas that actually enrich your understanding the depth of, of what learning is about. And, and I wanted to, well, bring up, um, you know, the world is really unpredictable right now. Everyone's feeling it. We don't really know what things are going to look like 5, 10, 15 years from now. And, like, what are we educating students for? I mean, mm. we don't really know what kind of world they're going to be growing up in. So the more we narrow what they're learning, the less we can actually prepare them to be flexibly thinking enough to be able to adapt to whatever they find that we can't really predict. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I just want to make one other point about the testing is it costs a lot of money to test. And, you know, sometimes we just have to look back. It's like we have, I don't want to say it's some zero, but we have a certain amount of money to allocate to education how can we spend it that is uh, most valuable? I, you know, we keep hearing about Malloy's current budget and the Care for Kids program, which is a, a program that allows working poor families to, to send their children to high quality childcare centers, um, is being cut by $8 million this year. But if we switched our testing schedule to testing kids every other year, rather than every year, that eight million, that's what that $8 million is going towards. It's actually more than that. I heard the name uh, $10 million. Mm. So um, like, are we really spending our money where it has the most positive impact? And That's a fantastic point. I mean, I think going to every other year is getting closer to what, you know, I'm not against testing. I think that there's a definite benefit for having um, a certain amount of understanding in that standard kind of way, and, um, but, but it's, it's the amount and it's the high stakes of what we're doing with it right now. Um, I think that there's a benefit to knowing that we don't have certain schools that are just completely um, leaving behind their responsibilities, but, um, but I think that's, it's, it's, it's reaching a little bit more of, if we were to go towards something like that, towards every other year, reaching a little bit more of what is realistic and, um, and developmental and so much more for our kids. Um, could we go to, yeah, did yeah. you want to say? No, well, which one do you want to go to? I was um, going to start talking about Republic Ed very soon. Okay, just really quick, um, maybe. slide? Um, child child left behind or oh, actually let's do them all the real world skills cartoon okay yes here yeah we'll go through the slides yeah just quickly um yeah i okay. see you did well in school but what world's real world skills do you have tests i can take tests yeah which is you know part of it like where we are preparing kids for real worlds they should be working together they should be creative they should be, this is not this is not going to give you everything that you need but we're narrowing our curriculum too much what's next here okay come away from the window you don't want to be a child left behind oh. do you that one hurts yeah that one <laughs> does hurt the irony of no no child no child left behind but what does that mean um if you're not a part of the real world. And I mean, what this one I think leads perfectly to what you were 
asking is what is education for? Is it for being a part of the greater society where, where, you know, where, where we're all hopefully going to go into it and, and contribute and be a, a positive piece of right. the development of our society? And that's what the color and the movement outside is versus the siphoning of our brains with, the, with these testing modules. So uh, that's, I, yeah. I like that. Okay, we did this one. Did this one. is just qualities that are not measured by most tests. Yeah, I actually really don't like this visual at all, but I like <laughs> but yeah, I like the, the language. Yeah. You, yeah. I, and then the last one we have, because we'll have to give up this laptop in a minute, is oh, the okay. Thomas Jefferson quote, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society but the people themselves. And if we think of them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them but to inform their discretion. So back in- No, Jeff just bam. Yeah. Wow. And so I want to talk about what Republic Ed has done over the past year, year and a half, and you know what the plans are and how people can get involved. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the programs that we had. Well, we've had a- um a film series, so a local um, at here at our, our local level or whoever, you know, whatever is most local, not just New London, but we've had a little bit of a film series, so um, I'm running to it right now on the laptop to try to see. So we've had um, the story of uh, the history of public education, so back to your question of like why have this institution, um, and we had a, a professor from Connecticut College, Lauren Anderson, that came and moderated a conversation about this. Which and was, it kind of started almost with, um, well, the, the film started pre-Jefferson, but Thomas Jefferson was one of the moving yeah, yeah. forces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, if we were, and we see it now too, if we're going to have a functioning democracy, we need to have an informed public, otherwise it just won't work. Definitely, definitely. Um, the, another one that we had was to, we showed a film called Defies Measurement, and it was to what we were speaking about, um, uh, high stakes testing. It was specifically centered around a school out in California, was yeah, it? So. Um, that was innovative and new and so exciting, and it had really taken these kids from um, really tough situations and inspired them and the, the, these kids spoke of this middle school into their ad adulthood but what is it that happened to the school when it had to move into um, uh, being being focused on a high state on the on the testing situation how it, it it became this this duller place that no longer was so inspiring so that was another one that we had and then um, we had one about discipline yeah, um, we had um, one about ending the school to prison pipeline, education, not incarceration. Um, that one was a while ago, so yeah. I'm starting to forget. Um, well, we have like three minutes left, so maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about some things we might be doing in the future and let people know how they can find out more about what's happening. Yeah, well, our, our um, website is republiced.org, um, and feel free to check that out. Like I said, it's very preliminary, the, um, the online resource library there, but you know, if you have resources to share with us, please do. There's a, um, there's a, a place to send us an email through there. Um, we are, we, we definitely, we just started um, our a new intern last week, yeah. so we're so excited to have her with us, um, Julie is with us now. Um, we could use financial assistance always um, for hiring of youth interns, for um, the, pro the production for our events, for our- And we um, never charge people to come to our no, events. No, 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 no. So the money comes from somewhere. Definitely. We get so, grants, but donations, of course, are welcome. Yeah, yeah. So for all of our endeavors, if you'd like to help out, it's at republiced.org. Um, you can. Um, donate tax deductible donation there. Um, what am I leaving out, Rana? Um, well, the, we're just planning. Um, if you get on our mailing list and learn more about our upcoming events, we are planning to have both more films in the future as um, public, you know, just for the general public, but also planning to start a series of, of speakers who are specialists in some areas of education that are relevant to 
New London and to the state and nation. So I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so go to the website. You'll get an idea of what the past programs are. Um, I don't think we really have time to go into any like big uh, topics. Wait. I know it's unfortunately. Oh, okay. I really you, wanted you to have, talk okay. about about relay you, and um, oh. Lauren Anderson from Connecticut College wrote this article. If you want to look it up, it was from November first. Um, it was Connecticut can do better for my, for minority teacher candidates on relay. G S E um, and I don't really have time. No, we didn't re really have time. But but the general problem is that with all this testing and the narrowness of the curriculum, the teaching profession is is under threat. It's not fun anymore. It's not challenging, and the requirements. There, there are so many alternate routes that the requirements are just. Um, not what they should be. Yeah, this be. is an alternate route that the State Department of Education actually did approve that um, Every, it's, a really, it's a really sad scenario. The campus is a P.O. box. Um, the uh, faculty are unnamed and not required to hold degrees comparable to teacher educa educators everywhere. I'm just quoting And taxpayer money is paying for it. Yeah, so, but if you want to look that up. Okay, so we're down to our last minute. So please minute. go on republiced.org. Yeah. Um, check us out. Donate if you can. Um, join our events. Keep an eye out for our next events that are coming up. Um, and let's continue the conversation yeah. about what we need in public education and how to preserve it. Thank you, Myrna. Thank you, Rana. <laughs> and, and, and don't forget, go to Board of Ed meetings, too, because that, that's, that's important one. as well. Definitely. Let us know. So, yeah, we'll see you next week. And I'm not quite sure what the topic is, but it'll be something else, some other crisis. <laughs> see you then. Thank you.